and welcome to Joy in Our Town. I'm George Cope, and I'm going to be your host for the next 30 minutes as we talk about issues that are important to people in Central Florida and that ultimately bring joy in our lives because of the conversation that we're going to have. We have pretty tough conversations on this program. If you are a viewer on an ongoing basis, we're not trying to fluff things up. We're talking about real issues because it, life is real and, it, and the situations that we face are challenging. But we want to bring hope. We want to bring insight. We want to bring education to you. And today's program is going to be no different. Today we want to talk about an issue that has probably, over the last 15 years, it has grown higher and higher on our scale of, of, of consciousness. We are becoming more and more aware of it. It's not a pretty subject, it's not an easy subject, but it's a necessary subject to talk about, and that is the whole area of terrorism in the world in which we live today. I'm, I'm honored to welcome Craig Gundry. Welcome, Craig, to our program. Pleasure. Craig, is, uh, you serve as the Vice President of Special Projects for Critical Intervention Services, and you have distinguished yourself as a world's foremost expert in security programs, design and management, risk and violence. That's a pretty big scenario and responsibility for, for you. But thank you that you were willing to take the time to sort of integrate yourself and focus on areas that most of us give little or no uh, thought to in the process, but we're doing so now. Why is terrorism become such a massive conversation. I mean, there's not a day that goes by on our news that we're not talking about terrorism in some form. Why now and what's going on? Well, obviously, we have been con dealing with terrorism for decades now. I mean, uh, however, I think that for the average public, the issues become much more real because of some of the changes we've been seeing in recent years with regards to the targeting being conducted by terrorists. Also, at least in the domestic United States, historically, a very large number of the events that we uh, think about when we look back on the past were targets against very high-profile targets executed in a large, dramatic way by an organized terrorist group. Now we've been seeing a trend in recent years towards homegrown violent extremism, acts of terrorism being executed by radicalized actors, often with very little warning before the actual attack occurs, and in many cases, very simple attacks, but in environments that everybody associates with day to day, such as shopping malls or nightclubs and other similar types of public venues. Well, since you bring that up, as you know, here in Orlando, we had the Pulse shooting and it, it, it set our city back because no one expects to go through that kind of situation. Why do those things happen now with, so without being detected? I mean, we had a guy come from South Florida to Orlando and target a nightclub, created all this havoc. What, what is going on in the human mind that we need to be much more aware of so that when we walk into life and its situations, the nightclubs or the, the malls, that we become aware of our surroundings? And why are people doing that? Why do they target a place like that? Well. <clears throat> Keep in mind that there are some unique differences from a lot of the attacks that we're seeing in recent years from what we've seen historically. A lot, there's been a major trend in the last 10 years, particularly in the United States, but also evident in Europe as well, towards homegrown violent extremists, lone actors that may be inspired or enabled, as the, as the term is being used these days, by active terrorist groups like the Islamic State or Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, but planning and executing attacks independent from the direction of those organizations. As a result, we have a much shorter what we call flash to bang time. From the time that an individual is radicalized and, or at least planning and conceiving of an attack to the time that they actually follow through. We have actually had a lot of successes over the last 10 years in disrupting plots involving international organized terrorist groups because of the communications involved, because of the capabilities of the intelligence services and law enforcement in terms of identifying connections between actors and then being able to, through investigation and other activities, being able to unravel those plans before they occur. When we're talking about a lone actor, it's a lot more challenging because if they don't show up on the radar screen as a result of communications or otherwise, and because of the very short time period we're talking about, it's very easy for those kinds of attacks to slip between the cracks. 
it's changed our world and, and there are people that, as I mentioned earlier, that are going out or not going out as much because of their fear factor. Yeah, let's just be practical because our people that are viewing just want the practical so often. They sure. we understand that there's an issue. We may not understand it for sure to the depth that you sure. do. What would you encourage a person as, as they live a normal life to go out and what's the What's the protocol for life now in this world in which we live? Well, I, I'll tell you, before we, let me first say, to put the threat in context, the threat is very real. However, that being said, you know, the, the person, you know, people have to keep in mind that the chances of dying in an act of homicide, at least according to the CDC, are only one in 325, far less than being in a vehicle accident or falling down a flight of stairs for that matter. The chances of dying in an act of workplace violence um, less than 9% of hom or excuse me, deaths in the workplace are the act of homicide. So the, statistically, the chances of actually being a victim in one of these events is very low. But these kinds of events are real nevertheless. In fact, I actually have my own personal story regarding this, regarding my second oldest daughter, wow. who was at the Strozer Library at Florida State University 30 minutes before Myron Ray walked in and started shooting, shooting it up, injuring three right. people and then dying himself. Nevertheless, there are things that people can do and things that people should know that can greatly mitigate their risk in these circumstances. One of which is being aware of your environment. When we're out in public, people have a tendency to kind of uh, uh, be oblivious to what's going on around them. If you see something out of context, you know, a bag, that, a box that's been abandoned or an, a person that's behaving in a suspicious manner, point it out to somebody's attention. DHS has had this see something, say something campaign going on for some time and that is actually pretty good advice. Also knowing what to do in these kinds of events is very critical too. Okay. What's the difference then between uh, the types of violence that you're talking about, this lone wolf and uh, Al Qaeda and ISIS that mm -hmm. we're dealing with? Because I, again, that, that's a massive, is there connection or what is that connection and how do you process that? Sure, well, uh, many of probably close to 90% or more of the attacks and plots that we've seen here in the United States in the last 10 years have been the result of lone terrorists or homegrown violent extremists maybe operating as a pair such as the Sarnia brothers in Boston. Many of them are inspired by the propaganda, the rhetoric, the ideology, and may even receive some degree of direction with regards to identifying possible targets by organized groups like the Islamic State now cutting the Arabian Peninsula. But many of these organized groups, primarily operating out of the Middle East, but in other parts of the world too, are having greater and greater difficulty organizing complex operations directed at the United States or inside the United States. Many of them have actually failed, such as the Times Square uh, bombing, for example, and the Curtis Colwell attacks that were stopped by you know, a police officer at the front. Uh, as a result, the, the, the message that they're trying to communicate to these radicals is don't come here to Yemen, don't come here to Syria. Instead, take it upon yourself, you know, buy a weapon, Make a bomb. Here's the instructions on how to do so. And then go out there and do it. And by the way, don't communicate with us extensively about it because you're going to show up on the radar of the authorities. And that is the challenge that we're facing right now in the law enforcement and the intelligence community. Okay. So it, the, uh, the, the whole idea of terrorism then is to just disrupt society to the point that it creates fear? Is that ultimately what, why terrorism goes on and, and occurs the way it does? Well, that is the core objective. Now, there's often other strategic objectives, right. as it were, politically, that they're trying to accomplish, like pressuring a government into conceding to their desires or their demands, trying to pressure the public into taking actions that align with their, their goals or their will, rally support from their support base by showing the vulnerability of the target government, that they're a vital organization. In fact, for the Islamic State, that's a major part of their motivation. They're trying to show that they are a vital, valid movement and that they are propelling society globally towards what they see as being their apocalyptic vision. Um, for Al-Qaeda, it's a little bit different. They're somewhat more pragmatic, but they do share a lot of similarities. Uh, you know, we, um, we've politicized this whole terrorism thing to the point that a lot of people think that it's just another plot or propaganda that even the American government to take away liberties mm -hmm. from humanity from, or from our society. Um, help us, give us some perspective to that. You got any thoughts as it relates? I mean, terrorism has opened a door, there's sure. no doubt, and we're now running down this hall. Um, is it legitimate and is it 
Are freedoms being lost necessary because we're having to deal with this from your perspective? Carlos Mataguela, when he wrote the classic text of terrorism, the mini-manual of the urban guerrilla, this was a 1970s era leftist terrorist in Latin America, described one of the objectives of urban warfare, terrorism, was to drive a wedge between the government and the people by provoking the government to taking repressive actions. Well, it's kind of ironic because in some regards, what Mataguela said was, uh, was accurate. I mean, we do see that in many regards. Uh, that being, you know, and keeping that in mind, there are ways that most of these attacks can be prevented. The question is, at what point do we as a society accept certain types of public safety measures that would otherwise infringe upon our personal rights to privacy and other similar types of means? I think what we're seeing right now is, uh, is, is, is a reasonable debate going on within the public sphere about at what point do we accept certain types of measures? At what point are we willing to accept some compromises in, our, in terms of our privacy or our civil liberties in order to provide for more effective public safety? I don't think we have come to a consensus on this issue, and it probably uh, we may never come to a consensus on this matter. Um, it, it, it is complex, there's no doubt. And what you're dealing with is um, admirable at best because I realize that uh, an unprepared a society is then the vulnerable society. So there's no doubt about that. When we come back, um, this is a faith channel, as you know, and we talk about spiritual things here. And there is no doubt that God and God alone knows our future. But uh, I, I want to ask you when we return from our break, based on uh, what's happening today, where do you see the trends going? And uh, so I'm going to ask you to stay with us for just a few more minutes because we have an expert with us. And uh, Craig Gundry is a man that is world renowned as it relates to his ability to help uh, deal with terrorism and analyze it and help us common folk to know better how to deal with life and and how we're going to move forward in our thought process. So we're going to take a break. And when we come back, uh, Craig, you'll answer that question for us. Really? And uh, we'll just take and let our, our future uh, rest in the hands of a man that has a better perspective than we do. So please stay with us as we'll take about a 30 minutes, our 30 second break right here on Joy in Our Town. And we'll be back. Stay with us. It's a beautiful day out here, sunny today with light breezes, giving way to clouds in the afternoon. We could see some light precipitation to moderate precipitation later on, followed by powerful storm-like conditions. Welcome back to Joy in Our Town. I'm George Cope, and I'm glad that you've chosen to stay with us. It's uh, nice to have Craig Gundry with us, a man who is specialized in his whole life now in understanding terrorism and trying to help society understand where we're at and what we're doing. Just before the break, Craig, I, I, I asked the question, we as faith people know that there is a God that has all things figured out, but we're not God. So we do have to ask the question, and I think it's only uh, logical to ask the question, based on what's happening and how it seems to have escalated, or at least it continues to be recognized in our world, where do you see the trends taking us in terrorism and this sure. whole idea of safety in America? Sure. Well, you know, when we talk about this issue of mass violence, Obviously, terrorism is one dimension, but we also in the United States are dealing with another reality as well, and that is non-ideologically motivated violence. Things like school shootings perpetrated by people like Adam Lanza or students that have escalated to the point of violence or people like James Egan Holmes and other individuals like this. Now, addressing that first subject, terrorism, I actually concur with the Department of Homeland Security in their current assessments. The Department, DHS, and many of their recent bulletins as well as also uh, uh, Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, Jen Johnson, stated just uh, uh, yesterday that we predict the trend of homegrown violent extremist attacks to continue, if not maybe even be increasing, as a result of the uh, uh, propaganda that we see going on, as well as as we become more successful globally in interrupting these networks or disrupting their capability in the Middle East, 
it is very likely that we're going to continue to see an increase in activity domestically or inspired activity. It was also pointed out by FBI Director uh, Comey that they anticipate, and I would concur with this, that many of the extremists that have gone to the Middle East with Islamic State, as Islamic State begins to lose territory, lose support regionally, and their capabilities begin to diminish, it is quite likely that we'll begin seeing these people trying to infiltrate their way back to the West, executing attacks, which is basically what we're seeing or have been seeing to some degree in Europe. And that is likely, as they we are more successful, that we're going to see the intensity and the ferocity of these kinds of attacks increasing. With regards to the non-ideological perpetrators, individuals that execute mass acts of violence in the workplace, often motivated for personal reasons, often complex reasons, everything uh, involving psych you know, from psychological disorders and pathology to nar you know, extreme narcissism, revenge, and other similar types of factors, that has been a, a problem that we've been contending with for a very long time. And a lot of those factors are very independent of the individual. It is, as our societies become more and more complex, I expect that we'll continue to see those kinds of attacks in the future as well. Well, it's not encouraging, but at least it's realistic, and we're not going to bury our head in the sands. And I would just remind you, friend, that, again, we serve a God who understands all of these things, and we're not the first country to go through this. When we look back through history, there have been a lot of countries that have experienced not terrorism as we would understand it in today's um, understanding and reality, but there has been persecution, there's been violence, there has been uh, mass, uh, mass uh, uh, effects in terms of homicide and those kinds of things that have gone on in people's lives, uh, or in, in people's worlds and in nations. Um, we haven't talked about some of the practical things. Let's sure. say that, that something does come down or happen within the context of, of a person's daily life, what would you encourage a person to do if they were faced face to face with a gunman, sure. someone that is trying to bring harm or disruption in, in that particular moment? How would I as a, a, a common citizen react? Well, I, I'm glad you brought this up. One of, the, one of the things, I spend a lot of time studying attacks and how people, you know, what, what adversaries do, what the, what the bad guys doing, as well as also the way people respond. And one of the most tragic things that I come across over and over again is people freezing or taking no action at all as a result of the effects of what's called the sympathetic nervous system, which kicks in in high-stress situations. The best way to combat the sympathetic nervous system is to have at least a basic template for a plan as to what to do. Now, the Department of Homeland Security has had an awareness program for educating people in response to active shooter events. The points they make are actually rather valid, and it's presented in a prioritized way. Run, hide, fight. However, when I am teaching employee groups, which is a large part of my work these days, and working with others, I actually am not a big fan of that choice of words because it doesn't quite tell the whole story. Instead, I prefer to use the words escape. If the option exists, if there is a path of egress from where that activity is going on or where we suspect the threat is, get out of there as quickly as possible. Now, that may mean running, but it may also be mean moving cautiously and methodically to try to get to a safe location. The second, if a path of escape is not possible or if we don't know where the threat is, a lot of times when we look at these events afterwards, we are looking with perfect yeah, hindsight. 2020. But in the reality, there's what we call the fog of war. People don't really know what's going on. Where is the threat? All we hear is the gunfire going on. In those kinds of circumstances, if we're not sure where the safe route is, then it may make more sense to barricade in place. But if you do choose what DHS calls hide, make sure it's a location that can be effectively secured. So when I'm educating employees in the workplace, one of the things I emphasize is know what rooms in your facility meet that criteria. Can the office be effectively locked without a key? Do you mean, are the doors do you mean sufficiently robust enough that they'll prevent forced entry? Are there large glass windows on those doors or right next to them that would provide an easy point of entry? If so, then that doesn't meet the criteria. Same thing goes when we're in a public environment too. Knowing, for example, that don't run into a public restroom to try to hide because public restrooms normally can't be secured. And in a large number of tragedies in the past, people have run to public restrooms before only to be caught at some point by the gunman later on. Now, if running and hiding or escaping and barricading is not an option, then in the last case scenario, if one is faced with a threat at close range and there's no other option, then using whatever force may be available to protect yourselves and others in proximity has 
in a number of cases, been successful in mitigating attacks. Mm. Many of the um, terrorist attacks uh, lately seem to be occurring in, in these public places, like we said, the shopping malls and all that. Is there anything else that a person could know that would make them better prepared? In, in, in and their families specifically, because I think that oftentimes we go as individuals, but sure. in families, what would you help a family in doing if they're going to go out and participate in these places? Is there a suggestion in terms of what they should be aware of? Well, if, you know, if I may say, you know, again, getting back to what I said earlier, the threat of actually being a victim in one of these events is very, very low. Okay. And, and, and I point that out because a lot of people are living with a fear of these issues these right. days. Okay. Now, that being said, I would not change my day-to-day -day habits. I would not change my day-to-day -day routines, but the way I go about my day-to-day -day business, be aware of your environment. Be aware of what's going on. If, if you are in a public, especially in a public location, like a theater or a restaurant or a place like this, be aware of the egress points. Okay. Part of the reason why people do freeze and often make bad decisions in these events is because suddenly when that event happens, they're now forced with making a complex decision. What do I do? And when that sympathetic nervous system kicks in, it interferes with that uh, problem-solving ability. Yeah. I think that maybe that's now why we, when we get on an airplane, they say these are where your exits are sure. because they do want you to know if there is an emergency and how to do that. So that, that would be key to it. Um, is there any good news? I, 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 you know, in the yes. midst of what you do, I, I, I will, first of all, let me just say, it must be challenging to deal in the world of terrorism every day what you have to do. And so, first of all, I want to say thank you for being a person that's willing to do, go there and do that. But do you see anything positive out there? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. I, I had mentioned a few minutes ago that we expect in the near future that the intensity and ferocity of attacks may even increase in the United States in response to the Islamic State and other groups' reduction in capabilities internationally. I think that we are becoming more and more successful, at least on the global stage, in interrupting the complex networks of these organizations and their capabilities to strike us in the homeland, as well as our allies and fellow citizens of the world in other countries, such as in Europe. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, it's a painful process, mm -hmm. and we see them adapt to what we do, both in terms of their tactics and their strategy. So while there's a good news story to all of this, there's also you know, things that come along with that as well. So I do think that the long-term picture is optimistic, but as the term has been used, this is a long war, and I expect that we'll be dealing with these issues for many years to come. I, I'm sure there are a lot of our viewers, too, that, um, that are, have family and friends that are in workplaces. Sure. Are, are you finding that workplaces have adjusted to provide training and development for this area so that people now become more aware of what's taking place in the workplace? That's actually about 70 percent of my work as a consultant, is working with companies and businesses and things like this and civic organizations in terms of how to improve their level of security. I will say that nationwide, a lot of organizations are awakening to the reality of these threats and recognizing that they have a duty of care to provide for a safe workplace and provide for a safe environment for the public to be. Now, the way that they may implement different kinds of measures does vary from environment to environment. For example, a, a, a business with an office building can use certain physical security measures that a theater may not be able to implement. But there are certain things that they should universally all be looking at. For example, having effective emergency management plans, communication systems. Very importantly, providing training for their employees in terms of what to do in these kinds of events. Um, in terms of dealing with workplace violence, there's things we can do on the human resources side of the house in terms of how we deal with potential threatening behavior in the workplace. If we're concerned about outside terrorist attacks, surveillance detection, suspicious activity reporting, and similar issues, I do see many of my clients advancing in that kind of a direction and implementing these approaches, but it is still a new reality to many businesses in the country today. We are just uh, normal, everyday kind of people, and I would like for you to just take a moment and look in that camera, and I would like for you to just sort of talk to those people. Take off sort of the professional hat right. for a moment. You're sitting in, in a, your easy chair, and you're watching this program, and you're probably filled with a lot of emotions and a lot of concerns. Sure. What would you say to uh, that person that's watching just before we got a couple of minutes left, just that will sort of help them to put all of this in perspective sure. and be able to step out with confidence that life is going to go on? The chance of you as a citizen being in an act 
impact of mass violence, shooting, bombing, or something like this, is statistically similar to being hit by lightning. It is very, very, very low. There's things that we can do to be prepared that if an event like this does happen, can reduce our risk. By having a personal plan, by knowing personally how to respond in these different kinds of events, you can greatly reduce your potential risk to yourself and your family. But I do not recommend that you allow the fear and anxiety that may be associated with these things that we see in the headlines paralyze you or impair you from the things that you do every day and from enjoying the experience of life and the many blessings that the Lord has given us. Instead, live your life, but do so with awareness and preparedness. And you know, uh, we will, you know, uh, at that point, uh, you will have managed your risk and fulfilled your responsibility to yourself and your family. Great. Craig, thank you so very much for, uh, for spending 30 minutes with us. To, I was uh, encouraging. You know, I, I was wondering when we started this, uh, our program, it's such a heavy subject, but the encouraging, thank you for giving me some perspective. I sincerely appreciate that. And I just want you to know, friend, uh, as we're preparing now to uh, part ways for uh, another week, that you would remember that, that God, the God of heaven and earth that created us, is a, is a God that understands, he, and he gives us grace, he gives us strength, he gives us his provision to be able to face any and everything in our lives. You're not the first person to live in a world where terrorism has been involved. All you've got to do is read this book and you'll find that for thousands of years, people have struggled with these issues. But God has been faithful and I would just encourage you to never forget, he's not given us fear, he's given us the promise of his presence. And so I would encourage you to call upon him. So Lord, today, thank you for Craig. I pray your protection and blessing upon this man and that our president, leaders, and those in authority over us will know that you're a God of faithfulness and provision. I bless our viewers today and remind them that you're with them, you're for them, and you're going to take and never leave us. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thank you for joining us this week on Joy in Our Town. I hope that you've enjoyed our conversation. We'll see you right back here next week, same time. Until then, God bless you. Have a great week, and we'll see you next week right here on Joy in Our Town. This program has been sponsored by the Trinity Broadcasting Network, Post Office Box A, Santa Ana, California, 92711.